Welcome back everybody to another reaction video as we continue through this series on the Turkish century uh, from the Hittites to Ataturk. We are now on to chapter seven. If you have not seen the first six chapters of my reaction, the link is in the description below that'll take you back to the beginning. Also in the description is the link to the original content creator so you can check them out. Welcome all of your feedback. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, I've learned a lot along the way. And so we're going to continue this. We're going to dive right into it. We'll knock off the last couple of chapters here this week before I head out to Vicksburg next week. Also coming very soon will be chapter two uh, of the story of reconstruction in my Forgotten History series. That's coming soon as well as another Sabaton reaction. So be watching for that. Here we go. Cool opening. Our story, the story of modern Turkey, begins here on the beach in the Dardanelles, in a place called Gallipoli. And to fully understand and appreciate, we need to go back to be introduced to the man who would make and shape modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He was born as Mustafa in 1881 in Salonika, which is today's Thessaloniki in modern-day Greece. It might seem weird to you, but in the Ottoman Empire, commoners did not have last names, only the royal family did. Growing up in Ottoman Which is kind of interesting because it's the exact opposite of, say, the royal family in uh, the UK where they don't typically use last names, but everybody else does. So I did not know that, that that's how that worked in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Very interesting. Greece as a Turk would impact his views in later life. The experience of being part of a minority in a majority culture, but also in that he was exposed to the nationalism and ideas of the Greeks around him at the time. Not just if Greece should be an independent state or not, but whether it should be a Hellenic kingdom or a Hellenic republic. In school he would excel at maths and prove to be a very intelligent kid, resulting in his teacher giving him his second name, Kemal, from the Arabic word for excellence. Hmm. After school he would enroll in an Ottoman military academy in Northern Macedonia and later in the Ottoman military staff college in Istanbul, pursuing a career as an army officer. It was through his path through the military institutions of the empire that he met and joined the various revolutionary movements around the Young Turks. He himself also got the chance to travel abroad and also formed revolutionary organizations such as in Damascus. With the you know, this is a pretty common thing that seems to happen with this time and place in history where you have these rulers who rise uh, in their own nations, but have had experience in other places. You know, even later in history, I think of people like Admiral Yamamoto, who is, you know, the great naval commander for the Japanese. He goes to Harvard in the United States. Um, you know, people like the some of the czars uh, of Russia uh, who had traveled west and learned about Western culture and, and the way things were done. Uh, you know, a lot of these people have these experiences by traveling outside of their own nation to see how things are done elsewhere. And that's an important thing to have happen because it gives you a different perspective than you would have simply staying in your own nation. So it's interesting that happened with him as well. The intention of reforming the empire. He was in many ways a rebel. He smoked a lot and even drank a lot of alcohol, which was highly forbidden in the empire. He read illegal literature, discussed with his comrades how the empire should be reformed, and at one point even landed in jail for his activities. But there were big differences between him and the other mostly young Turk officers. Most importantly, he was not a young Turk. Neither did he believe in their ideas and plans. The young Turks mainly looked for their inspiration on how to reform the empire to the German empire and to German nationalism as something to copy. So he keeps talking about the young Turks and we haven't really discussed that in this series. So let's take a few minutes just to kind of back up and put some context to this. 
So we're just gonna dive into Wikipedia. It's the easiest place to look for some of this information. It's all sourced, so I have no problem with Wikipedia as a place to get information provided that they've got their sources and they do here. It's a political reform movement in the early 20th century that favored the replacement of the Ottoman Empire's absolute monarchy with a constitutional government. So, you know, it's kind of in keeping with what's happening in the West, uh, but not so much in the East where you've got you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German Empire, and you've got the Russian Empire, places where they're dominated by, um, by monarchies. Not necessarily completely absolute monarchies, uh, but certainly more so than, say, the United Kingdom. Uh, despite working with the young Ottomans to promulgate a constitution, uh, Abdul, uh, Abdul Hamid II had dissolved the parliament by 1878, and returned to the absolutist regi regime marked by extensive use of secret police to silence dissent and by massacres con committed against minorities. So you can see how that kind of works out. So now the term young uh, Turk is used to signify an insurgent person trying to take control of a situation or organization by force or political maneuver. So, you know, and again, that was something that dominated life in this time and place. There are a lot of such uh, kind of rebellions rising from within they're happening in russia where you have a number of assassinations that take place a lot of political assassinations at this point uh in europe and in asia happened a couple of times in japan uh happened in some of the slavic states and uh so uh, turkey and the ottoman empire is no different than that the strict militaristic state hierarchy of what was basically a military dictatorship was in their opinion the only way to save the ottoman empire Mustafa Kemal, however, disagreed. He was more interested in what he had seen in France, in particular the French Republic. He saw the pluralistic political system of the French Republic and its desire for progress and advancement in society and the sciences as a better model to copy. He learned to read and speak French, and as such, while the Young Turks read the translations of Prussian militarists, Mustafa Kemal preferred reading the works of French revolutionary and Enlightenment philosophers. So I want to go back for a second, because I want to see, it, it had something in French there, and I didn't quite However, catch disagreed. what it was. He was more interested in what he had seen in France, in particular the French Republic. So he I saw the pluralistic political were. system of the French Republic and its desire for progress and advancement in society and the sciences as a better model to copy. He learned to read and speak French. Uh, il n'y a pas fumé sans feu. So I think that's the word for um, smoke. So I will not smoke without, I don't know what that word is there, but I think that's what the rest of that means. Somebody help me out with my French here. And as such, while the Young Turks read the translations of Prussian militarists, Mustafa Kemal preferred reading the works of French revolutionary and Enlightenment philosophers. In particular, his favorite one, Auguste Comte. A positivist who strictly rejected all forms of metaphysical thought, advocated for the advancement of society in thinking and actions reasoned and based on scientific facts and research, and in particular, advocated for mankind to liberate itself by abandoning all forms of religious mm. ballast and superstition. Generally, in the history of the last 200 years, Comte's writing had more of an impact than most are even aware of. Yeah. So, you know, I can see the parallels with his thoughts and with the French Revolution where they adopt what's called the cult of reason. They kind of try to move away from religion completely. Eventually, it becomes the cult of the supreme being because they realize people aren't ready to give up on religion totally, but they don't necessarily want the dogma of a particular religion. So it becomes more of like a deist type of thing where people kind of believe in there being a higher power, but not really one that intervenes or that is, uh, you know, subscribes to a particular religion. Um, so this is, you know, kind of adopting some of the things that were going on in the French Revolution. They're basically the foundation of modern French secularism known as laïcité. And you will find one of his quotes about achieving order and progress, at least partially, on the flag of the Brazilian Republic, whose founders were readers and admirers of Comte. Hmm. But most significant for our story, they shaped the political thinking of the young officer cadet Mustafa Kemal. He believed the young Turks didn't go far enough, that they still clung on to old and outdated traditions, that their thinking was still by and large backward, that the German Empire they modeled themselves after was also backward, and that only radical social and state reforms modeled after European republics such as France would be the solution. You might have even heard or read some of his quotes from this era. There is only one civilization, the European hmm. civilization. There is no second civilization, 
civilization is the European civilization. And it must be established here with all of its thorns and roses. So interesting that he wants to identify more with Europe. You know, Turkey's always been kind of in that weird place where most of it is in Asia, but it really, in many ways, does kind of model itself more after Europe than it does after Asia. Uh, but it's kind of in that middle, kind of a hybrid between the two. So very interesting. And there was a second large point of this agreement between Mustafa Kemal and the Young Turks. And that disagreement was probably the biggest one, one with which Mustafa Kemal was also largely ahead of his time. He didn't believe that the empire should continue. He believed that the age of empires and colonialism was coming to an end. He also rejected ideas like Enver Pasha's Turanism, the idea of a pan-Turkish empire stretching from China to the Balkans as fantasies and delusions. Instead, he advocated for a small Turkish solution. The empire should disband and it should give up rule of the Arabs and the peoples of the Balkans. He also believed that empire held nations back, that for the Ottomans being tied into the Islamic world, in particular the Arab world, tied the Turks into religious-based political and social backwardness. Therefore, Turkey should give up the idea of being the leaders of the Islamic world, reject all cultural influences from there, draw borders around the smaller, more compact, and mostly ethnically and lingually unison Turkish homeland, instead of seeking deeper ties into Arabia and Iran, and to build new bridges into Europe and North America and rebuild itself as a modern Turkish. So, all very interesting things. He wants to, he very much wants Turkey to be a Western style power uh, rather than identifying with the religious ties they might have with uh, with the Arab powers even though they're they're really not Arab they're not Western they're again kind of caught in the middle so you can see how there's going to be a strong group of people who are going to want to identify with one a strong group who are going to identify with the other and it'll be interesting to see how they worked all that out nation state by the time of the Young Turk coup, Mustafa Kemal had risen to the rank of colonel, and by the entry of the First World War, was one of the most experienced military leaders of the Ottoman army, with combat experience in the war with Italy and the Second Balkan War. But because of his beliefs, he was kept away from any political power or even any significant military post. His relationship with the Young Turk government was strenuous at best, but eventually he was given a post commanding a division in Gallipoli, and it was there where he proved his worth. Unlike many of his young Turk contemporaries, he didn't just dress like a soldier, but actually was one. He had a better understanding of modern warfare and the defensive tactics of trench warfare. When the British sent an army of Australian and New Zealand troops to take the Dardanelles and Istanbul with the intention of knocking the Ottomans out of the war, he correctly anticipated where the attacks would take place to then organize and command a successful defense and what would be the first Ottoman victory of the war. The vi yeah, you know, um, the Ottoman Empire doesn't enter the war right away. Uh, they kind of sit back, but it's always kind of understood that if and when they do enter, they're going to enter on the side of the central powers with you know the German Empire and Austro-Hungarians, uh, which is going to put them at war with the Russians who border them quite a bit. And they've always kind of had that natural um, rivalry with the Russians. Uh, but it's going to put them at war with the people that Ataturk is trying to identify themselves more with, the, those Western powers like France, uh, who he very much kind of looks up to in terms of the, the way their government is. But yeah, Gallipoli is just such a disaster for these Anzac forces. Uh, and this was kind of the brainchild of uh, the uh, then uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, who was Winston Churchill, uh, who then steps down from that position, ends up uh, enlisting, or not enlisting, but getting a, a commission in the in the army uh, to go to the ground forces. Uh, but yeah, this was just a complete disaster. It was one of those moments kind of like um, the Operation uh, Market Garden in World War II, where you're thinking we're going to do this kind of ambitious, very bold thing that hopefully is going to help bring an end quicker. And in this case, we're gonna do this bold move that hopefully is gonna knock Turkey, the Ottoman Empire out of the war, and it doesn't happen. In fact, it's a complete disaster. The victory at Gallipoli changed his prospects as the German allies, but also the young Turks, had to recognize his potential. But far more important for later years, the fact that he was fighting in Gallipoli kept him clear of any involvement in the Armenian genocide 
that was taking place at the same time. Mm. He was promoted to general in 1916 and given command of part of the army in the Caucasus where the Russians had recently launched an invasion of Anatolia. Under his command, the Russians were defeated at Bitlis, halting any further Russian advances. This victory made it abundantly clear that Gallipoli had not been a fluke and that he was one of the most competent commanders in the Ottoman army. For so now he's defeated the uh, Australian and New Zealand forces, the Anzacs at Gallipoli, uh, with the support of the British Navy, he's now defeated the Russians in the field. So now people can't turn their back on him. They've got to recognize that, that he has shown his competence on the field. For which, by 1917, he was put in charge of Ottoman forces in the Levant facing the British and the Arab revolt. But there were no victories to be found there. After years of incompetent leadership under Jamal Pasha and his attempts to terrorize the Arabs into obedience, the Ottomans had all but lost control over Arabia. Jerusalem fell to the British, as did Basra and Baghdad, and the Arabs were in full revolt in the remaining lands. By 1918, the Arab revolt had their biggest victory when they took Damascus and started marching on Aleppo. Faced with what would have been certain defeat, Mustafa Kemal decided to instead save his army and organized a retreat back into Anatolia. It was at this point, literally in the same week that Mustafa Kemal retreated his army into Anatolia in fact, that the Sultan, Mehmet VI, reached out to the Allied powers for peace and had an armistice signed. The f so they're the first ones, or the last ones to enter on the Central Power side, first ones to, to end up done. And, uh, you know, this kind of coincides with, with, with the Russians also leaving the war. Uh, because they're having, they're in the midst of their revolution, and so that ends. And so you've knocked out one power on each side, and a big front on which the the fighting is taking place. Three young Turk pashas who had dragged the Ottoman Empire into this catastrophe in the first place, as well as conducted the Armenian genocide, all fled abroad to escape being held accountable. Which in the end didn't help them much. Talad Pasha was shot dead by an Armenian in Berlin in 1921. Enver Pasha was killed by an Armenian Red Army officer in the Caucasus in 1922. Jamal Pasha was killed in Georgia in 1922 by a group of free Armenians. And many other senior Young Turk figures involved in the Armenian genocide who had fled abroad were killed by Armenians. It is all Let's talk about Operation Nemesis for just a second. So very much like some of the things that happened in the aftermath of World War II where you have Israeli uh, special forces kind of going out and um, you know rounding up people, eventually people like Adolf Eichmann, for example. Uh, you have a similar thing happening here where you have the assassination of Ottoman uh, perpetrators of the Armenian Genocide and Azerbaijani people held responsible for the massacres uh, between 1920 and 1922. Uh, so it doesn't say exactly how many there were. We know, um, uh, here we go, here's all the assassinations. So there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven total, including the three Pashas that we talked about already. Uh, one in Georgia, one in Germany, one in Constantinople. Uh, we've got one in Italy, uh, again, Berlin, a couple of them, and then one in Soviet Georgia. So, uh, so they really did kind of go after these guys and hunt them down. Uh, very interesting. I might want to at some point look a little further into this uh if there's any good videos that you guys are aware of on that topic let me know i'd like to check those out it's also often forgotten today that in the aftermath of the war legal action was taken against many of the ottoman officials who had partaken in the armenian genocide in the defeated ottoman empire this was demanded by the allies and also endorsed by mustafa kemal who wrote it is our main wish that the rule of law be applied impartially Good and him. that complete justice begins. Since the responsibility in our country is equally shared by young and old, the punishment should not only remain on paper, thereby remaining only propaganda mm. which can lead to many unnecessary discussions, but should be carried out since this would successfully impress the foreign element. So, you know, I, I don't know a lot about, about Mustafa Kemal, uh, you know, Ataturk, uh, but what I've heard so far, I'm impressed by. He seems to understand the direction that the country needs to go in order to survive, but also to thrive. Uh, he also understands the political landscape. And, and whether this is just him recognizing what has to happen politically, or if he really truly felt like this is something that needed to be dealt with and dealt with with justice, 
I don't know, but either way, it's the right step to take. So I'm impressed by that. I'll be curious to see what more we can learn about him. The court martials set up by the Istanbul and Ankara governments were, however, lackluster, designed in a way that cabinet members could influence outcomes and sentencing, and many of those involved managed to escape punishment. By 1920, in the Paris suburb of Sèvres, Sultan Mehmet VI was made to sign the Treaty of Sèvres, a peace treaty even harsher than the Treaty of Versailles was on the Germans. Mm. The Ottoman Empire's lands in Arabia were to be divided up between the British and the French. Eastern Anatolia would be divided up amongst the newly formed Armenian Republic and the new Kurdish state. Southern Anatolia would be given to the French. Eastern Anatolia divided amongst the Italians and Greeks. The Dardanelles and mm. Istanbul would become a formerly international zone, however under British occupation, so basically part of the British Empire. The Turks would be restricted to a small remaining wow. rump state in northern Anatolia, which was 15% of what the empire was before the war. So I don't know financially what the hit was to them, but that is a huge, devastating decision in terms of breaking up that empire, how little of it was left for them and under a de facto colonial supervision. Adding to that were crippling reparations, it became it abundantly clear that the Turks were to have their lands divided up as colonies to the victors. This treaty was unacceptable to Mustafa Kemal, who in mid-1919 was tasked with reorganizing the Ottoman army to crush any resistance against the treaty and the Sultan in the remaining rump state. Instead, he assembled a congress and from the small town of Ankara declared independence from the Sultan's government and proclaimed to resist the foreign occupation of Anatolia, beginning the Turkish War of Independence. That war, from the onset, seemed absolutely hopeless. The Turks were on their own and pretty much surrounded. The Greeks used this crisis to invade Anatolia in an attempt to build a greater Greece. The Armenians also invaded in an attempt to take the lands inhabited by Armenians before the genocide. The French army occupied vast parts of southern Anatolia, intent on dismantling Ottoman state and cultural structures. A large British fleet was anchored in Istanbul, and the Kurds by now were eager to build their own promised state. But a so gutsy to even attempt something like this, and it says a lot about his character that he saw all of these obstacles and still thought it was possible so interesting a series of events at the beginning of this conflict pushed things into mustafa kemal's favor the british found oil in the kurdish homelands of northern mesopotamia which led to them betraying the kurds instead of giving them their own homeland they clustered them into the new colonial administration of iraq on the arab overlords the remaining Kurds in Anatolia consequently sided with Mustafa Kemal, who promised them equality under Turkish rule and the resurrection of the Caliphate. So isn't it interesting, and this is something that happens a lot in history, where powerful uh, nations will uh, make agreements with weaker people or nations or groups because they don't feel there's any reason not to. And as soon as there's a really good reason to not follow through on their agreement, they do. You know, I just was reading recently about uh, the westward expansion of the United States and during Grant's administration, the uh, the deals that were made with the Lakota Sioux in, uh, you know, kind of north central plains. Uh, and, you know, they kind of gave them all of this land. It was a pretty big area and it was fine until some people snuck in there and discovered there was gold in the Black Hills. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, sorry, never mind. We take it back. Kind of the same thing that's happening here. Things looked far tougher in the east, as the Turks seemed to be in for a long protracted war with the Armenians. However, in 1920, out of the blue, the Soviet Union invaded Armenia and annexed it. With that, there were no more threats from the east. To the south, the French got bogged down in the guerrilla war with the local Turkish population and in early 1920 were defeated by the Turkish National Army under Mustafa Kemal's command, leaving them with no other choice but to retreat back into French-occupied Syria. By far the biggest threat were the Greeks, who seized control of Anatolian lands that were actually promised to the Italians and marched into central Anatolia mm. with one victory after another. The Greeks got close to taking Ankara but were halted and pushed back by 1921 under Mustafa Kemal's command. The war ended in 1922 with the Greeks retreating and the burning of the Greek city of Smyrna, which would later be rebuilt and renamed to Izmir. The end of the war with the Greeks pretty much solidified a Turkish victory, and the British, rather than fight, decided to abandon Istanbul and make peace with the Turks. 
This victory was a triumph that would cement Mustafa Kemal mm. as a national hero yeah. even before he had established his state. There are only five countries in the world that avoided being colonized, most through concessions and alliances with other empires or by becoming colonial empires themselves. Turkey is unique amongst them in that under Mustafa Kemal's leadership, it is the only one which managed to avoid colonization by fighting those who sought to colonize it, and more importantly, doing so on its own and outnumbered. It made Mustafa Kemal the savior of the nation yeah. and the revered leader and anti-colonial hero, even outside of Turkey, where many leaders in Arabia, Iran and Pakistan would seek to copy him in the future. This war, however, also significantly changed the social makeup of Anatolia. There used to be a Greek population of up to 2 million people in Anatolia before the First World War, and with the burning of Izmir, the last big Greek population center disappeared. You can today still travel throughout the coastlines of Anatolia and you will find empty Greek towns and wow. villages whose population packed and fled between 1914 and 1922. In the peace agreement, the League of Nations ordered a population exchange. One and a half million Greeks were to leave Turkey and head for Greece, while a million Turks were to leave Greece and head for Turkey. It is I mean, it kind of makes sense, but wow, I mean, that's really interesting with like kind of these ghost towns of former Greek uh Cities. It's important to I never knew that. that today this would be considered to be ethnic cleansing, but at the time it was seen as a legitimate policy measure to guarantee peace. But, as we will see later, it didn't. What it did, however, do was change Anatolia, which for millennia had been a place of multiple cultures and faiths. The Christian population was reduced to a mere 2%, and the Anatolia Mustafa Kemal inherited was a by and large ethnically and religiously monomorphic society of Sunni Muslim Turks. Thousands of these Turks watched in late 1923 as the last British ships and troops left Istanbul. They all still wore the traditional Islamic headdress for men called the Fez. Most of them probably had no idea that they were witnessing the dawn of a new age and the radical break with the past, unprecedented not just for Turkey but in all of human history. On the 29th of October 1923, the Turkish Republic was declared after mm. the Sultanate had been abolished in the previous year. The only thing that this republic would keep from the past was the flag. Interesting. Is that the end of that chapter? I think it is. All right, we're going to wrap it up right there. Let me know your thoughts. There's a lot there to digest, and I know that a bunch of you will probably have something to add to this conversation. Please use the comment section below. Let's keep this conversation going. We'll be back tomorrow with Chapter 8. Thanks for watching.